I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Gary Meegan is, amongst other things, a father, a husband and a chef. He's also one of Australia's most recognisable and loved TV personalities, having hosted the smash hit MasterChef for the last 10 years. Gary, tell me, mate, how did you find, honestly, how did you find the process of having to land on the five? Was it easy or difficult, irritating, boring, exciting? It's it's always exciting. You know, my life, I feel these days, is full of interesting things, and that's what I appreciate most about it. I mean, once upon a time, I was just a lowly chef. I used to go to work every day and cook my heart out, you know, for thankless people. And now I do lots of interesting things. So if I can can do a bit of radio and I can, you know, uh, do a book appearance and do a bit of television and do a demonstration and, you know, all that sort of stuff, then it it makes my life um, wild and varied and interesting. One of those thankless people would have been me, I reckon. You were the con weren't you when I was an advertising executive in London young and stupid yeah Ho- hopefully spending lots of money a lot of companies money I should the imagine. company's money <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah it was you know what I mean it seems such a age away such a long time ago I mean I've I started uh, at college uh 83, went to work in 86, I think it was in London, uh, maybe the year, just be the year before and um yeah I, you know the the industry has changed a lot. Uh, it was a really aggressive place. It was, I describe it these days, I think of it as a building site, uh, you know, full of um, odd personalities and misfits and all sorts of things. There were no such thing as a human resources department back then. I think it was just a hatch hmm. where they used to shove an envelope out once a week which had your wages in it. And it wasn't very thick either. And actually, I remember walking through the streets of London and going, Dad never told me about the banking industry. How come he never told me about that? You know, so. He said, follow your dreams, son, follow your dreams. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a very different place. It was, uh, you know, I, I remember the first day at work just being complete, after three years training, doing a diploma at uh, Highbury College, you know, which was a dream, you know, for all sorts of reasons, you know, uh, just uh, our social lives and our education and, you know, feeling young and free-spirited uh, and ending up in the, you know, this dungeon of this, you know, five-star, this you know, institution of a hotel, uh, you know, with a two Michelin star restaurant at the time. And it was just, I've never, I'd never experienced anything like it, you know, steaming pots and screaming and, you know, tons of food coming in one door and food going out the other way. And just, you know, it, it, it was exciting. You know, it was thrilling. It was new. Um, I'd never seen anything like it, but it was also vaguely terrifying for the first few weeks. I remember. Have, have you read um, Orwell's Down and Out in Paris and London? I've read bits of it. It never, never actually captivated me. So, so the the description that but he, descriptions he, oh, in there, yeah, of being absolutely. a lowly worker in a restaurant, you know, violent, yeah. dangerous. Yeah. Uh, no, it was, it, it was, it was, it was violent. I mean, I remember various punch ups. I mean, I remember somebody getting stabbed in the kitchen after service. Not, not you know, on the body, but in the arm, uh, as a result of a bit of a fracas. And the result was nothing. Yep. But it was like that. But it was, in a sense, on, on the flip side of it, it was as commies, as apprentices, as young chefs, we used to work hard to earn the right 
to learn a recipe. That's what it was all about, you know. So it was hierarchical and uh, and difficult. It was, you know, we thought of ourselves as like this crack squad, you know, uh, deliberately tough and hard and being able to put up with everything, which is rubbish when you think about it now. But we we used to work hard to be taught that kind of um, the holy grail of whatever it was, you know, whether it was the, you know, matignon de veau or the, the consomme or that perfect mashed potato. And, and we knew when we did well because someone would say, come here, and then they would show us step by step by step. And then, you know, off we went. And then we were the keeper of that recipe. So we always tried really hard to make sure that it always matched everybody's standard. Um, and, of course, now training happens in a very different way and a much better way. Um, but j- believe me, those lessons are drilled into my head. I don't forget. <laughs> I don't forget those recipes at all. I reckon I could go back and cook the whole menu without a problem. We're going to start with your film, and you have yeah. chosen the 1982 Ridley Scott classic uh, Blade Runner. Well, um, yeah, I know. Random, isn't it? Uh, well, no. but it's a cult movie. And so, so you're a sci-fi fan, or you were, or. I- I was. I'm not anymore, but uh, I remember growing up as a teenager, I think Dad was a big fan of all the classics, and that uh, movie uh, was based on a book. It was one of the first books that Dad ever gave me, and it wasn't a thick science fiction book, but it was a... um, Sounds funny when I say it, because most people don't even know who he is, but Philip K. Dick, and he wrote a number of really groundbreaking science fiction um, uh, pieces, and one of them was Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?, and Dad gave it to me, and that got me hooked. So then I read everything from Asimov to, you know, Philip K. Dick to all sorts of things. I mean, I remember being kind of so into it at the time that my English teacher gave me these random old sci-fis that when I think back uh, were describing uh, the future much like Flash Gordon, you know, with big valves and dials and sparks, uh, which is obviously very different to, to what we have. But, yeah, I suppose it was, I don't know, as a young lad, it kind of appealed to my dreamy, you know, superhero, super future kind of idea of what, you know, you know, I remember watching Space Odyssey 2001 and thinking, wow. I remember dad telling me when he watched, you know, the lunar uh, module landing, which obviously a lot of people actually still think is a conspiracy, but he said, we all thought that actually we'd all be living on space stations, you know, in the 2000s. So it just shows you, doesn't it? You would have been 15 when that came out. So were you still on Hailing Island? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, live in a, you know, I I think we lived a very lucky childhood growing up on Hailing. And when I go back, I actually have the opposite uh, feeling. I almost get a, I pull over um, just before the bridge because there's a bridge that goes over onto the island. You can see Portsmouth one way, you can see the Isle of Wight and Emsworth and, you know, which is a little kind of yachting, you know, area, a little harbour, the the Solent. Um, And I get this kind of foreboding in a sense because it's so small. It's such a small community. Mum and dad have lived there since... Uh, probably a couple of years before I was born, and it was a, an escape from London for them. But for me, growing up, it was all fields and foreshores, and you know, kind of Eni Blyton in a way. <laughs> that's what we. That's what we felt. That's what we felt. You know, long summers. You know, people laugh. They go, "Yeah, from England, there's no such thing as a long summer." I go, "I remember them, and we were we used to be tanned and and free and riding our bikes and doing what we wanted." Does your sister live in UK, hailing Australia, or? Yep. Yeah, no, she lives uh, very close by, to, near Chichester, which is literally uh, 15 minutes from mum and dad's house and never really moved away again. Uh, feels very connected to the south coast of England. And um, I mean, it is a beautiful area. The South Downs, Chichester, uh, places like Lavent are quintessentially, you know, we're talking, I mean, one of my old school friends is a master thatcher. Don't say that when you're drunk. But um, he's, uh, yeah, he, he, he said, oh, I'd love to come to Australia, but not much need for thatching over there because really, you know, you're looking at that kind of, you know, classic old uh, English village, little pubs, you know, rolling green hills. And at the end of summer, it's gorgeous and I get all wistful and romantic. Um, and then my mum will, you know, bash me on the shoulder and remind me that it doesn't look like that for most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> the winter closes in fairly quickly after that. But yeah, she's a uh, crash investigator with the police and has been, with the police force for a long time. Has she any idea how famous you are? <laughs> uh, I've never done that. I've always felt, uh, I think the three of us, particularly on MasterChef, have always felt we're very lucky. Um, we consider it a real privilege that we occupy a certain space in the Australian uh, psyche or mentality. I think MasterChef's been around long enough for that to have happened. And I've never boasted about it. I certainly, I think they were surprised the first time they came out um, 
when MasterChef, because my sister particularly had never been a regular visitor and she came out um, a long time, probably 10 years after I'd been out. So I'd never been a regular visitor, now much more as she's got older. Um, but uh, yeah, first time walking down the street and saying, why does everybody keep saying hello to you? You know, like, and as we, we walk behind you, because I'd never boasted, I'd never, yeah. you know, I actually, I said to her this visit, she came over at Christmas, I said, I, I realise I don't actually send you, other than my books, I don't send you constant updates and magazine articles. I don't even keep them myself. Hmm. So why would I send them to her? So the, the connection they have now is watching MasterChef in the UK. And the Australian MasterChef now is very popular over in the UK. So, but they're, they're a little bit behind. So yeah, they they, they kind of get it, but they find it quite strange. We're going from sci-fi to non-fiction. You've chosen Henry Cooper's autobiography, written in 1974. You, you must have been seven. When, when, when did you? Was it read to you, or did it? Did you read? No, this no. Is it my, my? You know what? That book was only given to me. I'm a massive boxing fan. My dad was always a big. My dad is so not a sportsman. You know, he's an engineer, uh, very measured, very quiet, very patient. Completely opposite to me. Um, and and he was never into sport, but he loved rugby and he loved boxing particularly. So I grew up with the the greats, you know, back in the day, you know, and uh, I remember watching Muhammad Ali and Fraser and Hearns Hagler, all these people that uh, occupy, the, you know, and I've said that word before, but occupy that space in my head. And I, and now I'm an even bigger boxing fan. And uh, one of our exec producers, who's a lovely man, a guy called Tim Tony, he's uh, very dear to us. Uh, I think it was birthday before last, went to a secondhand bookstore and got me a, a copy of um, Henry Cooper's uh, biography and gave it to me for my birthday. And it was just, I had the loveliest birthday. I think it was my 50th. I went to the lake house uh, with Mandy. We, you know, Ella Wolf Tasker is a good friend of ours and industry colleague and uh, chatted to her, had a beautiful dinner, spent the weekend reading that uh, book and just being, just, yeah, it was just a, really relaxing. I couldn't think of a better birthday and a, and a present that probably really only cost a couple of bucks. Uh, but Henry and you would, Henry Cooper, you would know this was uh, good old Henry was a, uh, you know, he was part of the revolution of men's, uh, what would you call it? Hygiene with brute aftershave. Do you remember that stuff? Oh, I certainly do. Splash, Splash it, all over. it all over. Splash it all over, he used to say. And it changed, um, along with Old Spice, <laughs> to <laughs> horrible fragrances, to be honest. It changed um, how, how British men, I think, um, decorated themselves, if you would say that. It's amazing <laughs> how, how a story, a sporting story, can go into a national psyche. So that the fourth round yeah. left hook knockdown, Henry's hammer, putting... Ca- yeah. He did didn't win the bloody fight, but he put him on his no. backside. And and, I, and I'm 55, and, and and I know you know you know everyone in my English family would if you said Henry Cooper would say yep fourth round left hook you know clocked him on the chin yeah put him on his pants he put Cassius Clay as he was known then yeah on his ass that's what it was and for, <laughs> and and um, you know in in boxing circles. Henry Cooper's a legend, as Muhammad Ali is, you know, as Pacquiao is, you know, today, or Money Mayweather. I mean, he, you know, he was renowned uh, as, a, as a bit of a brawler, as a bit of a businessman too, like that story of his manager and how the, the boxing world worked and operated, how they would line fights up and pick and choose fights. But the fact that he was always, his brother was a boxer too, and the fact that his, uh, he was always accused of cutting easily, yeah. and that's what lost him the fight, you know, that in the end... Regardless of outcome, um, he lost that he lost the fight because of that cut. But he still put Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali on his ass for for being a smart ass American, and the British loved that. <laughs> <laughs> and the story about um, uh, Cassius Clay's camp cutting the glove to buy him a few more seconds. Well, Oof. that's right, and yeah. it's still it's still controversial to this day, and it's an absolute bloody fact when you watch it. Yeah, you go, that's what they did, and that's why he ended up with a cut eye. And so, I think that for the for the English, because you know, certainly growing up in England, I think, and maybe there's a lot of English people, maybe even yourself, that disagree with that. We're so used to nearly getting there but used to defeat. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think we'd always, we'd, we'd build it up, whether it was the football or the rugby or the cricket, whatever, and maybe it was just the period that I was growing up in, but we'd, we'd be in the final, we'd be in the last round, we'd be in the last set, whatever it was, and we'd always lose. And so we always got used to that. And actually coming to Australia, it changed the way I thought about sport because we'd always win. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it wasn't, I think the Rugby World Cup turned that around when um, Wilkinson, when he booted that try at the last minute, you know, it was a, a change in... In, in fortunes for British sport, in a sense. But yeah, I always remember staying up till the wee hours in the morning listening to, um, uh, and I've 
got a, a Bruno, Frank Bruno, fight Tyson. Yeah. And, of course, get knock, knocked out. And then the, the second time, you know, fought Tyson, got knocked out. So, yeah. You know, it's just part of the game. The British have, got the, have mastered the art of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. That's right. That's, <laughs> I think that's... We coined the phrase. Now, we're going to move you from the 70s to the 90s for your uh, song. And, mate, I can't yeah. thank you enough for choosing this because Neil Finn, in my eyes, I mean, he's not even human. Legend. He, yeah, just a, 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 a legend. dead set bloody legend. Now, you've chosen Distant Sun by Crowded House from 1993. Yeah. Uh, tell me why you've chosen that one. Um... I don't, I don't know. I think it, it strikes a chord in terms of, you know, I always feel slightly emotional with that song. There's a couple of their uh, songs that always kind of strike a chord. And maybe there's a lyric in there, and I can never quite remember it. You might be able to remind me of it, but it's um, old enough to... Still so young to travel so far, old enough to know who you are, wise enough to carry the scars, without any blame, there's no one to blame. Brilliant. I mean, just... And do you know, there's a line... In, in the penultimate verse that is possibly one of the best lines ever written, because he wrote the song about his relationship with his son, which it, it makes me well up even just reading it. It's just 12 words. I don't pretend to know what you want, but I offer love. And so I wonder, when you're listening to the song, do you, do you think of Jenna or do you think of your dad and you? Or, or? Yeah, I th yeah it, it makes me, it really, um, when I listen to it, it means lots of things to me. It means, you know, it could be Jenna, it could be my dad, my family, my grandfather, who was very important to me. It could mean just the fact that it's, uh, you know, in one lyric can sum up a very emotive uh, sense of what's important and what's not. Um, yeah, and I feel, you know, I feel, you know, emotional just thinking about that song. So I play that regularly. You know, it's one of my, you know, go to, even if I just listen to the first minute 27 to get that in, then I'm happy, you know. Um, but there's a number of songs. And I remember I wasn't lucky enough to go to the concert at, uh, you know, at the Opera House or, you know, um, in Sydney, but I would have loved to, you know, just, I think for so many people, they represent so much that band. Um, and, and I think music, you know, like food for me, uh, you know, great windows into people's souls, uh, their lives, uh, our similarities, our differences, all of those things. The other thing, the story I, I always remember is, is Paul McCartney was asked, um, this was about six years ago, uh, what's it like to be the world's greatest living songwriter? And without a beat, he said, I don't know, you'll have to ask Neil Finn. That's incredible. Your place, you've chosen, oh, what a gorgeous city, you've chosen Paris. Tell me about that. What's the story behind that? As much as I, as a chef now, as a, as a cook, as a foodie now, I love Southeast Asia with a passion. Like, I love spice and chili and hot, you know, sweet, sour, hot. Uh, you know, the, the roots of my cooking, you know, going back to those Connaught days, are classic French food. Um, and when I go to France, and I, and I tend to go fairly regularly now or try to it's kind of my uh homeland for food you know like it's um it's a very special place and and it can be a, the, the produce and and italy's the same italy's full of great produce but not not in the same way for me that france is you know it's great butter and great cheeses and when we talk about you know often i and i i use the same lines go here in australia we produce some of the best cheeses in the world and i do that with a little twinkle in my eye because i go yeah but france is always going to be better than we are <laughs> because you know there are hundreds of cheeses and i'll arrive and and the only thing i'm thinking about on the plane is shopping you know i want to go and buy you know beautiful um ham and beautiful cheese and butter and bread you know and pastries and it just it just yeah it's the key to my heart and it is a beautiful <laughs> it is a beautiful city i mean we you know it it, it you, you realize why uh, the french had a revolution you realize why you know there was such um uh poverty at that time but such overt wealth and it was all on show and it is a beautiful town and the little laneways and the streets and and i also think that the french have this um and like and i think the australians should almost have the same uh approach like i've always somebody once told me when i came to australia australians um you got have to understand they they don't like authority and um it was a really good way of me 
learning to manage my kitchen staff when I first came here because I'd tell people what to do and they'd go, why? And I don't, can you just, not why, just do it. <laughs> but then, of course, because that underlying, you know, this healthy disdain for authority is really what makes Australia tick, you know, that lovable larrikin, is that that's what I fell in love with, that optimism. But then when I go to France, I go, now there's a group of people that if they feel passionate about something, they do something about it. I mean, they turn trucks over in the street, they'll, you know, students will riot, and I'm not condoning any violence, but what I'm saying is when you feel passionate, you got to do it. And sometimes I, l- I look at ourselves as Australians and I go, well, where is that larrikin spirit? Where is that healthy, you know, dislike of authority because we'll just go, ah, I don't like that very much. And then we just carry on. <laughs> so before I move you onto your possession, just quickly, here we go. There's going to be a grown man weeping. Is can you tell me a favourite place to eat in Paris or are they, are they all good? <laughs> they're, too, they're, too, they're too numerous. You know, they're, they're, you know what I'm loving about Paris right now is that, well, it, let's, put it, let's put it this way. Actually, George Columbaris went to, uh, we went on a, a culinary trip this year and he met his sister who happened to be there at the same time uh, with her son and they went to a uh, famous French brasserie, and he he has not been able to get over how bad it is oh. or was, you know, now for months, and he just he can't he hangs on it. So what I say is to anybody that's visiting Paris, try and avoid at all costs all of those classic touristy bistros, you know, those brasseries that sit on the corner that serve exactly the same yes. bad versions of onion the same soup food. and. Uh, yeah, and then the croque monsieur and the you know the steak frit, and there are occasional restaurants like Restaurant Paul Bear that are okay. But the the thrill of Paris right now is it's going through a massive change. So you can get great coffee. A lot of Australians there doing great little roasteries and things like that. Uh, brilliant pastry. I mean, so, some of the best pastry chefs in the world, um, and lots of. Um, you know, what used to be very expensive three Michelin style restaurants where all those chefs now who have trained there have now gone out, much like they have in, in Australia, in all our capitals, and gone into cheaper suburbs and open restaurants serving equally as good food. Um, so Papillon would be a favourite, Septime would be a favourite, Passage 53. Uh, and then if we're talking probably one of the most beautiful dining rooms and very expensive. You've got to take a mortgage out. You give them your wallet, actually, when you walk <laughs> through the front door and they'll just take what they're going to take, um, is La Maurice, which is just insane. And actually, I remember going there with Jenna and she was most upset because they handed all our menus uh, to us. And Mandy said, oh, there's no prices on my menu. And I went, oh, yeah, because of course, it's I've got the prices. <laughs> and my daughter, who's a teenager, go, that's disgusting. I want to leave. You know, that's, um, you know, that's sexist. You know, this is terrible. And you could sense straight away that the maitre d' or one of the, the chef de wrong, one of the senior waiters picked it up and just came in. And as I'm clumsily translating the menu, he goes, let me do that for you because I'll take her attention away and charmed her socks off. Nice. And so minutes, minutes later, she was the biggest fan and forgot all together about the fact that, yeah, she should have had prices on her menu too. <laughs> but it's amazing. Yeah, amazing room, amazing food. I've just come back from Vietnam and the, the food there just yeah. blew my mind. I yeah. mean, w- w- why did I not know? <laughs> you know, yeah, amazing. I feel an idiot. Yeah. It's just sensational. And then you get to my current obsession of, you know, and we live in Australia, which is very, very, you know, from a food perspective particularly, we have got a riot of different restaurants and, and food that, you know, you just, you don't experience in many places around the world. We're, we're a, really a world leader. A lot of eyes are on us right now. But because we are, you know, we clicked into all of these different cuisines and Vietnamese is one of my favourite, just because of the sweet, sour, salt, hot, mm. and because of the fact that it's often very crunchy and fresh. And Aussies love crunch too. We love crunch and creamy. You, you watch MasterChef, we're all about it. But it's part of the dining experience. And when you go to Vietnam, you you realise that, you know, our local Vietnamese restaurants serve you a bit of iceberg and a bit of Vietnamese men. You wonder why that, that's there. And then you go to Hanoi and you sit down and you eat a um, bang xiao, which is like a pancake, you know, with, uh, with a uh, little prawns and pork and pork fat that they dribble around the edge to make it super crispy. I apologise to anybody that doesn't eat pork, but it's delicious. And then they serve it with a mountain of different herbs and mm. river weeds and uh, things like that. And then you go, ah, that makes sense. So with every mouthful, you just get this explosion of kind of herbaceous deliciousness. Don't get me going. My mouth's watering. I, know, I'm I, I love listening to you get enthusiastic. We're going to stick on the food theme for your possession because uh, you have chosen yeah. a picture of of yourself and your two co-hosts uh, on yeah. MasterChef. But when was the picture taken, mate? 
Very early on in the piece, I think Matt's still got um, kind of a floppy hair and no beard. Um, so very early on, I reckon, second year in, when it was really taken off. Um, and it's a very special moment in time. In fact, to be honest, we kind of uh, remind ourselves that we're living a very special moment in time always because we we have the perfect job we 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 kind of in our inner circle describe our job almost like uh the top gear boys when it used to be sure. clarks clarks and and co um and we have the food equivalent of that job i mean we have the very best chefs on our show so we've we now are lucky enough to call people like heston blumenthal and nigella lawson yota matalangi uh david chang as as almost friends you know they're on speed dial we catch up with them you know when they're in town or when, when we're overseas now, it's a very um beautiful club now of people that have been through now 10 years going into its 11th year of the show so people say oh do you remember the contestants i go pretty much every single one of them and often uh, we'll catch up with them and certainly the most successful ones which uh, which there are lots of restaurateurs amongst them um that we now consider peers um so it's a very special experience and that that picture that i'm sure is is around somewhere of uh, Matt just looking up into the sky, George leaning over on his on his elbows, on his knees, and I, I can't even remember, and me just looking at the camera. I just look at it and go, wow, that that's the thing. That changed everything in my life. Yeah. And, I, and I'm pretty sure the boys feel the same way. Just the fact that, you know, I'd gone from at that time being a restaurateur and having a couple of restaurants and being very busy and caught up in my business and ostracized actually in my own business, that all of a sudden my world just went bang. And now I'm exposed to the kind of food world that, you know, that I love more than I've ever loved uh, now. You know, it's a beautiful thing. I, I have to say um, that the Marsh family... Uh, feel that we have grown up with you personally because it, it, we, we don't watch much telly but as a family with four growing children there, there was one show for the last decade that's been a sort of an appointment to view and it's been both the, the point of watching the, the wonderful show but also the the fact that we're doing this communally as a family and then that bleeds out into the office and in the friendship circles where you'll go down and say, can you believe, you know, what so-and-so said or what so-and-so said or what Matt's wearing or blah, blah, blah. blah. Uh, so it, it's a, you, you know, you, you occupy a, a very prominent place in a, in, in, in a sort of national conversation. I mean, I'm looking forward to the new yeah. series. You go, but it's a bloody TV yeah. show. But yeah, but I am. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I, I can't wait for it to get back on. You know, it's so... And, and most Australians don't realise the popularity overseas. I mean, we've, we reckon, you know, conservatively worldwide, there's an audience of about 15 million um, that are watching Australian MasterChef. I mean, in India, there's there's upwards of six million, uh, two plus million in South Africa, for example. Uh, similar numbers in Indonesia and Malaysia. And then you know we go to random places like Peru, where people are watching Australian. They're watching Australian MasterChef. It's on in South America. We're dubbed in you know Spanish and Portuguese through you know Brazil and Argentina and up to Venezuela. So when you get these moments, these odd moments where you'll be I don't know on the ground in Spain and people come up to you and go, "Can I have a photo?" But I'm from the Philippines. <laughs> you just go, "My goodness!" And I and I think too that it shows off. Uh, us very very well it shows off our diversity and our humor particularly um and our you know uh, healthy disrespect for authority i suppose our unity our uh, commonality um and it's yeah it's a it's a beautiful vehicle it's a really wonderful vehicle that could do i think in a sense so much more in the future too um, I was only saying to Matt the other day, I said that, you know, there's a, you know, we listen to lots of in and around the food space, whether it's sustainability or diet, you know, obesity, et cetera. And just think, I, I think, you know, the three of us got a bigger role to play in the future in, in that sense, because young people have, lots of young people have grown up with us. Yeah, you know, so they they're looking at three old men on telly. <laughs> we don't think we're three old men on telly, but that's what they're looking at. And and in the last three years, we've had contestants on that were nine and ten uh, when they you know, started watching our show. You know, where did you learn about cooking? From you. Wow. Yeah, no, I think your analogy of the Top Gear guys is really good one, mate. I mean, and I have to ask a question, and I don't want to embarrass anyone here, because it's a bit like Pete Best with the Beatles, and I didn't really realise this until I was researching for this show. It is, is it true? Because I can't remember it as a viewer, 
But is it true that year one there was four, not three? Have I made that up? Yeah. And then and that, that was that lovely Sarah. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so Sarah Wilson, who, um, you know, is enormously popular and actually um, ga- gave it away, but she was behind that whole I Quit Sugar. So she found her own place and space, you know, and, and actually probably more successful collectively worldwide than the three of us, like a massive movement and onto something new and very important, uh, which is all centred around food waste and sustainability. Um but yeah, and it was, I think what it was is because when they cast the show, and that's what it was, I remember going for auditions and I'm ringing George up and saying, are you auditioning for this MasterChef thing? And he goes, yeah, I am. And so we, um, we stayed in touch because George actually used to be in My Apprentice years ago. Ah. So, you know, back in the Sofidel days, which is a hotel here in Melbourne, a five-star hotel, Raymond Capaldi and myself were exec chef and exec sous chef and we employed George. And so he was with us for four years there as an apprentice. And he was a superstar. And then he came two years when we opened our first restaurant, which was Phoenix. So George and I have known each other for 23 years, thereabouts. And um, I rang him up and said, uh, I've just been uh, shortlisted for Sydney. So I think, you know, I might stand a chance. He said, so have I. And I remember going and they'd set up this very similar setup to what we do right now with, you know, a couple of us going to a table where the chef is cooking badly. And actually it was a chef we knew who was just deliberately cooking badly. And I'd been in with a couple of other top chefs and said, you know what, this is, they all just want to be stars. They just want to tell us, you know, want to tell everybody what they think. So I said, here's the deal. If we get called in together, I'll ask you what you think first, or you ask me what I think, and we'll just play play off like we normally would. And they picked it out and just said, you two get on like a house on fire. And then when, once we shoved Matt in the mix, we all realised very quickly that we talk an enormous amount of rubbish about food, still do, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it, and, it, and we're inseparable, and the, and the magic was... And we didn't see it as magic. Now I see it as magic. Now I see it as something quite unique. Back then, it just seemed quite comfortable. And I think people picked up on that and they just picked up on the fact that I remember the exec producer coming up to us and saying, this is not normally what we do in reality. I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. Because normally it's just, you know, banging away, ripping everybody to shreds. And we felt terrible about that. So we'd always do it like we would with our own stuff, where we would say uh, something that they might they could possibly do better and then hit them with something positive so they go away smiling. And he goes, that is just the opposite completely of television but keep doing it because it's working so there you go <laughs> I, I remember um, reading a, a really really lovely quote by Nigella uh, Lawson about you guys and, and the, the surprising global success of, of Australia MasterChef and why is it that it's the one that yeah. is, is most popular and she was just saying the most lovely things about you and the dynamic and go well because they, they sort of like the guests it's authentic. Then they're, they're not. You know, it, it's sort of. You know, they're not there. Yeah. To, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not sure if you're watching Married at First Sight or whatever else. Where that there's this horrible undercurrent of. You know, you're going to set up yeah. the nasty person or the this person. You go. It's just a lovely. Yeah. You get the sense that obviously you've got to do some of the usual TV bollocks. But but yeah. at the heart of it, there's an authenticity and a warmth that yeah. you go. Well, yeah, I like that. Well, it's not scripted. I mean, the executives always defer to us, and we defer to the gods of food. You know, whoever they are, because in the end, whatever delicious wins and it's never faked or fudged or changed um, and I think other programmers you know when they started to replicate the Australian style of MasterChef around the world uh, came and watched how we did it I remember sitting down with execs from Asia and they said so when do the execs come in and tell you who's won I said not on this show yeah and it's never been that way so it's lovely and I mean I remember when Nigella first came on the show I remember we never we didn't know what kind of Nigella would turn up. And what we meant by that is we didn't really know her. So as far as we're concerned, she could have been, you know, elusive and, you know, very chatty and, you know, had a, you know, a, uh, you know, 10 people surrounding her. But she just turned up with an assistant. And I remember saying to George, because we were a bit delayed, do you want to go for coffee? And he goes, yeah, let's go for coffee. And Matt goes, yeah, I'll go. And then Nigella goes, can I come? And we were in, I don't know if you know Melbourne at all, but we were on Ascot Vale Road in a little coffee shop, which is not the richest suburb. It's very working class, very normal. And I remember people walking past and going, oh my God, it's the three of you and Nigella Lawson. And strangely, it was like the, uh, what do they call that? It was like the drums, you know, were beating. And I remember the fire brigade, strange, the Ascot Vale fire brigade strangely turned up just on cue <laughs> and then all had photographs with Nigella. So as much as she gets on with us, we find that um, if we if we treat people as they're part of our, including contestants, they're just part of our community and that we want the best for them, then, you know, we get we get the best out of it. 
Oh, mate, listen, you're an absolute legend. You do such a good job. I, I wish I didn't have to wrap this up, but I'm going to finish with the last secret question that's becoming less secret, <laughs> which is who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next? Oh, actually, I heard, um, was it uh, John Eels the other yes. day on you? Yes. And, and he caught him unawares, and I went, oh, I must think about that, and I bloody forgot. <laughs> oh, dear. You know you know who I, I love to listen to, and, and you'll probably never be able to do it, but I love people like uh, Billy Colony. I love comedy. I love um, uh, people that have a wry and different view of the world and make us think about things. So if you can find somebody like that, because I think we need to take the piss out of ourselves yeah. a lot. And I think certainly people in authority, I'll get back to that Australianism <laughs> again, they need to be taking the piss out of a lot because they're responsible for a lot and they need to take us all seriously. So have a good think about that and see um, who you would pull into the studio. I don't think I can offer you more than that. No, no, that's great. Is that okay? Well, yeah, that's more than okay. Is We're going to okay? get a comedian on in your honour. And, and you, have, you have been an absolute legend in with your generosity and coming on the show, mate. So thank you. And I look forward Pleasure. to watching the next series. It's nice being interviewed for a change. I did, when I did my series of podcasts, I loved it. And I can see that you love it too. It's just a really nice... And I've just got so into podcasts now because it's a great opportunity to learn. It replaces the, uh, what do you call it? The talking book. Yes. Cassette. CD now podcast it's it's a brilliant thing so thanks for having me on The Five of My Life was presented by me Nigel Marsh producer Alex Mitchell sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. Listener.